Hello, and welcome to my channel. I am Damien Marie at Hope. In the simplest terms, I am an atheist humanist philosopher and prehistorical writer researcher at DamienMarieAtHope.com. I am specifically an axiological atheist. An axiological atheism can be thought to involve ethical and value theory reasoned and moral argument driven apathyism, agnosticism, atheism, anti-theism, anti-religionism, secularism, and humanism. Axiological atheists can be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. As an axiological atheism's ethically reasoned and constructive pro-humanity. I am an axiological thinker, value theorist. The science of goodness, worthiness, usefulness, valuableness, virtue, reliableness, accuracy, validity, morality, integrity, beneficialness, etc., etc. We axiologists have a value consciousness. And in general, we see the architecture of humanistic humanitarianism value in people that we see as dignity beings. Places and things are not. Axiology is a value theory. In its broadest sense, it involves areas of philosophy that are deemed to encompass some evaluative or evaluation aspect. Therefore, it crosses almost all domains in some way or another. Now for a more detailed terms as to what I am. I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science and am against pseudoscience, pseudo-history, pseudo-morality, things that are found in religion. Separate, sits on tap? Right, yeah, yeah. And just turning it on doesn't work. But if I unplug it and then turn it on, yippee. So we're um, all set to go, I think. Hey? Yeah. So let me get a little closer. This is a desktop. I don't use a laptop. Okay. All right. So um, go ahead and tell you know my audience uh, who you are and like a little bit of uh, synopsis about you. This is Alice. She was an archaeologist, anthropologist. Um, feminist and she's here today to talk about um, stuff like sexism that she experienced and racism yeah. and anthropology and yeah archaeology yeah but, can I just start yeah go ahead all right so let me start with my pile of books because okay. this is what brings us together correct all right so um hmm. you're gonna have to yeah you're gonna have to put All it quite, right. it, uh, well, I, here yeah. we go so this is me when i was young uh and excavating a fur trade post okay and where, where was it at this was out in uh, uh just a year ago really 2022 okay yeah so this is my most recent book, and it's different from everything else I wrote because it's personal all the way through. Right. But it's not an autobiography. You don't know anything about my dear children. <laughs> That's not part of what it's about. It's I really wrote it to be part of the history of American archaeology. And where it fits in is the book I'm working on right now. Well, I would be if I wasn't sitting here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and its title is the new one, not out, 
not written yet all together have right. come through truth and power in american archaeology yeah i know so that was kind of like a daydream like i'm walking along for a daily walk and thinking oh i wish i could just get all my rejected papers published together <laughs> and write about all the racist, imperialist prejudices that have resulted in their being rejected because they're on the side of the First Nations. And they're empirical. I'm looking at data right in front of me. And well, yeah, I, I read a recent article that said that even now in the U.S., more women are getting archaeology degrees, but yet yeah. they're not getting put in books. They're, yeah. they're not getting put in articles. They're not being absolutely. Put, they're not getting you know opportunities. So there's more women, but still less opportunities. I mean, yeah. Well, there is actually a committee that uh, looked into it, a commission that is put together by Society for American Archaeology, which is our big national main group. And it has uh, at least 7,000 members. I think it's got more than that. It actually had uh, somewhat over 3,000 people at its national meeting in um, April, this this April, yeah. Uh, some of the three thousand were coming, presenting remotely via Zoom. But I think there must have been two thousand in the convention center. It was packed for the first time since COVID, and everybody right. was hugging everybody and so glad and so on. But it's 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 it. It's the one that discusses ethics, and it has a history of archaeology group, of which I'm uh, a longtime member. So I was coming from history of archaeology work and interests. There is a group. It's not a big group, but <laughs> we're real. And um, concerned to document this long, long uh, effort of women to be recognized as, um, you know, mainstream archaeologists. So um, in 2016, I guess, maybe 2015 even, um, Saudi American Archaeology put together a group of five or six um, women archaeologists, maybe there was one man, um, and the, the chair of the group was a woman a little younger than me, not much, one of my generation really, and um, then um, an age range down to young new PhD women. And they uh, presented their report in 2017, and it was discussed in 2018 and 19. And at any rate, its conclusion was that, uh, well, now it's 15 years. More women than men are getting PhDs in archaeology. So it's right. at least 15 years. It's since 2000, basically. But among the higher-ranked universities, more men are being hired. Uh -huh. In spite of cuts in the faculties, which are terrible, more men are being hired than women. Women get hired at the lower-ranked universities, like where I worked. Mine was a Jesuit university. Even worse, you know, uh, they had an agenda, an agenda, and oh, the yeah. Pope, and it wasn't Pope Francis. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, so in the lower ranking universities, you have higher teaching loads, 
You do not have a uh, graduate student teaching assistants. You do it all yourself. Mm. You correct, in my case, hundreds of student exams every semester. Yours are by hand. I don't use computers to grade people. And these women get no research support, either in funds or in assistance. Yeah, that's not right. And a key thing that the committee discovered, women submit their papers to the journals. The editor goes in for peer review. Uh, it, incidentally, my experience, not really. I don't get peer reviews back. Really? The editor simply rejects without a peer review or has one that she doesn't share with me, which is against the policy. And that's that consistently happens to me. Hmm. So at any rate, um, as usual with, with many uh, submitted papers, um, in the best circumstances, the editor will send the paper out for at least two peer reviews. And in the best cases, the reviewers will take this seriously and make serious um, suggestions for improving in good faith. Right. Now, I say it's the best. It doesn't always happen, believe you me. <laughs> And uh, at any rate, then in the best circumstances, according to policies, the woman gets her paper back with suggestions for revision. This takes time. Right. This woman is correcting student term papers, student exams, meeting with students on some stupid faculty committees. The university is demanding she write grant proposals herself. Those are technical and difficult time consuming. Right. She decides she may have a family. Even if she doesn't, doesn't. She doesn't have the time to do all this work over again. And so she doesn't follow through. The committee talked, first of all, the committee, some of them had this experience. Uh, they talked to many women, and this was just consistently. Mm. I just didn't have the time. And it also means I never got any help. I just couldn't follow through that way. So it turns out that part of why fewer women get published is because they can't follow through. Hmm. Oh, okay. That's an important part of the situation. And altogether, uh, another uh, interesting fact. So back in 2019, I had a session, just a second, I'm getting rid of stupid Microsoft thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I organized a session for our SAA, Society of American Archaeology, annual meeting in 2019. And uh, so this is just before COVID. Um, and um, I called it Forum on Women. And the format was open the floor to anybody that wanted to come and talk about what they saw were issues for women. So I had to have three discussions to have the session that was the format required. So I got a woman of my generation, and I also made some remarks, right. and then a woman in the height of her career, and then a young uh, new PhD. All all of them very accomplished archaeologists, uh, writers, so on. Very good personality. So each we uh, briefly discussed uh, who she was, why she was there, um, what she saw as concerns. 
Then we opened the floor very quickly and we had about 45 people in the room, all women except for one man who listened and didn't say one word all the time. So <laughs> this goes on for two hours. Right. And uh, wonderful, wonderful contributions. And the startling thing that I heard, I had no idea, the majority of contract archaeology businesses and contract archaeology businesses are 90% of all archaeologists working in the United States and Canada. Wow. This is what archaeology is today. It's just that, contract work, don't you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of it produces research material. Um, some of the contract companies are oriented towards producing research material, uh, while, of course, uh, first of all, they help their clients fulfill right. um, the, um, the question of will uh, heritage material be destroyed and how can you not do it if this is possible. That's what the, these companies are paid to do survey, test, make recommendations. And 90% of people who are being employed as archaeologists work for contract companies. A lot of the contract programs are actually run by universities. They bring in money and they train students at the client's expense, basically, paying for right. courses. Yeah, so I mean, that's been the way for 30 years, 40 years, really. Okay. So the majority of contract companies are owned and operated by women. Oh, really? Wow. Next. The majority of these women owned businesses qualify for federal programs to aid women-owned small businesses. They can't compete with the big companies, all of which are either owned by men or owned oh. by couples, man and woman couple. Right, right. Yeah. So, okay. This is the kind of statistic that's not obvious. This actually, Damien, there is a recent book out called Data for Feminists. Uh, it has two authors. One of them is Catherine Dignazio. And I don't remember the other because uh, I know Catherine. But okay. she's a young MIT professor in data management. Data for Feminists is telling you, look for these kinds of qualifiers and data conclusions hmm. they're very important so that's the situation yeah uh, I, I read yeah. Uh, to your books and i definitely um uh, had a i would say a more positive view of archaeology and anthropology <laughs> because my experience is more recent i didn't even look into history stuff or care about it until i was 35 so it's 2006. So only from then, and then probably maybe even 2016, I really started getting more, okay. you know, in sure. a sense, looking at more academic stuff and talking with more yeah, archaeologists. Yeah, yeah. And I felt like, wow, archaeologists are really great people. Most people I did are, are you know, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm just saying, you know, from, <laughs> I thought they seemed to care about indigenous people. They care about women's rights, gay rights. They seem like some great people. I mean, but then I read your book and I was like, wow. Hey, this is why um, Catherine Ignazio and her fellow MIT professors, I mean, these women know what they're talking about. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. MIT Press Publishing, yeah. Uh, you know, this is exactly what they're saying. You don't get the full picture. You should at least be aware and. Um, ask what else might be involved in this uh, 
where I show or conclusion or whatever. Right. Okay, well, why don't we get on with um, my books and my work? Okay, so, okay. okay. Right now, um, I am in the middle of this book, Truth and Power in American Archaeology. I said it was something that I idly daydreamed about, and I thought, <laughs> no use even suggesting it, no academic press could publish it, and, and certainly no, you know, ordinary but Why is that? Yeah. Well, because it would be challenging the power in American oh. archaeology. Well, I would think that archaeology is still open to hear uh, contrary ideas. All I would right. Hope so I guess. <laughs> okay. Wait a moment. Here's another book. Um, you have to yeah, bring it. it wait bring a minute. It Where am I? Can't see it. Probably Here we there. go. Cut. Whoops. Oh. There. Controversies in archaeology. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to really see the bottom of it. Um, anyway, it's come on. It's probably got to be closer to your face, I think. Yeah, I got to turn it in. Come way closer to me. I guess closer to me. Well, that's what it's called. Con well, All you right. You, you get the idea of controversies in archaeology. Right. Uh, my name's on the bottom of it here. And it's published by Left Coast Press, which was in existence for, I think, 11 years. Mm. It was started by an archaeologist, Mitchell Allen, Mitch. It left Coast Press because he is a New Yorker through and through. His wife got a job at Berkeley in administration, and mm. there he was on the left coast. Yeah. And um, he had been working for a regular publisher and developing a, a list of publications in archaeology and decided to start his own um, as one of his um, authors said out of his back pocket <laughs> yeah. in walnut creek california which is uh, in uh, near oakland in the bay area but it's not okay. a good address <laughs> down in the flats yeah i i was born in southern california in santa Ana, uh, yeah. Beach. yeah yeah so he has this little office on the second floor. I've never actually been there. And he invited uh, archaeologists he knew. So he's liberal, um, data oriented, and right. um, we we'll follow theories. Yeah, we know about them, but we don't follow them. Um, no, he had, he immediately came up to me and he asked me right away when he he was going there saying, "I have a new press. I want to publish." Now, very first year, he said, I want you to publish a book on pre-Columbian uh, ocean voyages. I want to publish that. And I said, Mitch, I love to publish that. But these books that you're doing, they're paperbacks. They are meant to sell to undergraduate college courses. Right. They have to be written at the underground level. Right. They can't have dozens and dozens of pages of references. I can't do that. Right. Because for something so controversial, I would have to have pages and pages of references to all kinds of fields to support it. Uh, so true. I said, uh, wait, I said to it. I have a colleague in geography, Stephen Jett. Do you know uh, Steve Jett's work? No, I don't. Okay. Well, I should have taken his book and tried to hold it up. He has a, a book that came out in 2016 called Ancient Ocean Voyages. Ancient Ocean Voyages. and I, I think I read an article that referenced that book, maybe. Jett. Right. So for his whole professional life, Steve... Uh, Jet has been collecting uh, data, uh, reading about, talking to uh, pre-Columbian ocean voyages. And 
The book Ancient Ocean Crossings was published University of Alabama Press. It's an academic uh, scholarly book. And it has pages and pages and pages, hundreds and hundreds of references. Yeah. So I said to Mitch back then, when Steve's book gets published, then I'll write for you. Okay. Steve's book gets published in 2016. Hmm. And I follow through with, um, here we are, Tra Traveling Prehistoric Seas. Hmm. Anyway, it says Traveling Prehistoric, there yep. we go. All <laughs> right, yeah. And I say in the book, for references supporting my arguments, see, yeah, 2016 Ancient Ocean Crossings. Cool. Uh, unfortunately for me, having achieved his aim of getting this book published, Mitch Allen retired. Mm. He'd had enough of the hassles, and he retired to pursue other interests. So I don't blame him, but... What he did, innocently, sell Left Coast Press to Routledge Publishing, a global conglomerate. Mm. What did Routledge do? Bury it. Oh, really? At the professional anthropology, archaeology meetings, not a single Left Coast Press book is displayed. Wow. And I asked the people at the Routledge booth about Left Coast Press, they never heard of it. They don't know what I'm talking about. So what they did was quash a small competitor. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very sad. You can, Left Coast Press is still online. You can Google Left Coast Press and you see its catalog of books and you can order through Routledge Conglomerate, which is actually called Taylor and Francis. Right, another company. <laughs> Routledge is not the leader, the owner. It's just one of them. Yeah. So, so much for traveling prehistoric seas. Uh, long, well, uh, about when I said, no, Mitch, I can't do it until Jet provides the references. <laughs> Uh, gets, I mean, uh, his manuscript would have been two thick books, and he worked and worked and worked with the editor. Uh, they finally got it down to one book they could manage to publish. It's thick. So, okay. Uh, so then Miss says, How about you do for me a book called Controversies in Archaeology? I say, That sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah, he says. So that's the book, Controversies in Archaeology, which was published in 2008. We thought it would sell to um, uh, faculty who had to teach undergrad courses in schools, not the very top research universities, so they don't give a damn about undergrads, right. but in the sort of second rank where they do support research, but they also care about undergraduates and you have to be an effective teacher and attract students. That was all that kept me at Marquette. And Jess has been very happy if I flipped away, you know, because uh, they didn't want to support me. But it was student demand. Not a lot, but enough. Enough that my sections of intro anthropology, which was core curriculum, social sciences, humanities eligible, I taught it at 11 o'clock in the morning and you could come in the sweat you wore in bed. We didn't care. <laughs> um, by 11 o'clock in the morning, you had gotten out of bed and had some coffee. And I was, oh, okay. So in the middle of the campus, it's close to the dorm. I'll sign up for it. I'll get my credits. I just 
they, he looks like she's an interesting teacher. So I had more than a hundred students semester wow. after semester after, and I had to do everything correct, all the exams and everything myself by hand. But I mean, I cared. Right. And um, even though it was only an undergraduate major, out of my classes came not only many people who actually went into archaeology or employed in archaeology uh, and a uh, few in cultural anthropology too, um, but some of the outstanding leaders in our field, including the president of the American Anthropological Association, the big organization, 11,000 members and in 2017, 2019, my student, Alex Barker, was the president, the highest elected position, the highest right on. honor you could get. And I can tell you a few other names, but I won't bother. Uh, my students who was undergrads were turned it, out. It says I'm running out of time because I don't have pro. Okay. So it's right. only, it's going to cut off in 49 seconds. Just, oh, no. I, I can't control that. I have the other thing. It, we pay $35 a month for that yeah. other thing, but you couldn't. I see. That. I could not. I could not. Yeah. So this one, I only had a free thing. So it's almost, almost uh, over. I do, I do appreciate you coming on and everybody. Yeah. I'm going to put a blog in the, um, the comments or whatever the not comments, um, the description of the video so that, that you can get more stuff. And I, I put links in there also for, um, Alice's uh, books, but so I have. Do I have uh, a minute or two more to get yeah, nine seconds, on? seven seconds? Yeah, it's going fast. Well, I guess I can't do it then. Yeah, oh, it just ended. So, do we have to leave this an email now? I I don't know this system. Uh, I, I... Well, maybe we can just go on, and you see. How about that? Should we try? It says remaining time. I don't know how it says more time. It was. So just I, keep going. I, I don't. Well, is this, it says it's still recording. So I guess. Yeah, I guess just keep going. I don't. I don't know now. Now because now it says eight minutes and something uh, and twenty five seconds. Well, I, why don't we quit? Just go on. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Well, because I was, I, I didn't know, and it said it was going to end. So, well, yeah, okay. yeah. What I want to say uh, next, make it short, is that the first book I wrote, which is called North American Indians, okay, North American Indians. Yeah. This is the third edition. It's very thick. It has 638 pages. Wow. It's the third edition. It was published in 2006. The first edition was 1981. In 1992, the second, and then the third updated 2006. Um, like, Ten years ago, I said, no, I'm not updating anymore because anthropology departments no longer teach North American Indians. And the Native American studies programs don't teach these overviews, these ethno histories as textbooks. Really? They, yeah. The people who run them are mostly from English lit. They're professors of English. Some of them are historians by training, but they don't come from anthropology. It's it's very interesting. Anyway, so the reason I want to talk about my North American Indians, which I wrote my first sabbatical when I couldn't travel for research because I had three kids at home. Right. And I was asked to write this book 
because in the late 1970s, anthropology was a popular uh, course in uh, colleges and North American Indians was a very popular course because of the counterculture, 1960s hippies, everybody right. was going to sun dances and, uh, you know, ritual pipes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was all very romantic and so on. So I was asked by a publisher to write this just at the time my sabbatical was coming up. I said, yeah, I can do this. I'm stuck at home. I have library facilities, and I've been teaching this course for some years already, quite a few. Um, I'll do it. But I said to the publisher, I'm not doing the usual format, which is a set of chapters, one for each culture area, taking from the um, late 1800, late 19th century, right. classic ethnographies as if they're all dead and gone now. I mean, it's, a, it's like it was archaeology. They're dead and gone, and these are what you would have seen if you were then, but it's not anymore. I said, no. These people are with us. All these, what we now call First Nations, are with us. Right. I am writing it as ethno-history, take it or leave it. So, okay, they said, okay, go ahead. They, the proposal they sent out was sent to four professors who taught North American Indians. And all four of them said, we don't teach it this way. She's got a chapter on Mexico. No way. We never teach about Mexico. Why not? Uh, yeah, never. And uh, no, don't accept this proposal. But I have family that, because I'm <laughs> from Southern California, so I have uh, family who lives in Mexico. Cause, <laughs> yeah, cause, right. Cause, well, because my right. my uncle married yeah, a right. Hispanic woman from Mexico. I mean, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, stand up the Rio Grande now and look at all the people back. Yeah. And, I mean, you wade across, big deal. Yeah. Um, any rate, so all four of these professors um, said no, don't accept it. But the editor said. We're competing against other publishers, and this might work as a gimmick is different. So they said, go ahead. So I'm not going to go on the whole story. Uh, actually, I think it's in my memoir. But in the end, the editor said, it's a gamble, but I'll take it. So it comes out as ethno-history, which itself was a new thing. Uh, the um, American Society for Ethno History was founded in 1974, and this is 1979 that we're talking about. So right. this is the new thing, and I'm actually, I am proud. I don't say I'm proud of stuff, I but I'm proud that I insisted that we look at our First Nations as, as uh, having history as part of our history, and it's the only way you can talk about them is nations with histories. And after my book came out and became the best-selling textbook in its field, which, mind you, is not saying a lot. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But nevertheless, so briefly, um, all the subsequent textbooks on um, what we should call American First Nations uh, have done the ethno-history approach instead of the old-fashioned um, implying they're all dead and gone now. They're right. you know, artifacts of the past. So I am proud that I insisted and turned the whole like system um on his head i think it's great yeah excuse me the thing is by 1906 uh, i mean sorry 2006 already 
fewer and fewer uh, colleges were teaching this course. Uh, this third edition didn't sell very well. And when- to me personally, it should be taught in grade levels and in college, like almost yeah. like as a, as a mandatory. Yeah. I mean, we literally live on their land. I mean, yeah. the, the yeah. history is unbelievable. And we don't even yeah. talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's shameful. Well, you know, I mean, uh, nowadays, um, my colleagues, more or less my generation, tell me they keep this book on their shelf as a reference that they use a lot. You can use it as a reference. But uh, people don't look for this kind of um, reference that you can look stuff up on. They Google. So I'm right. competing against Google. Okay. Uh, I'm a safer reference than Google. Uh, but uh, all right. So at any rate, I said, I'm not doing another edition on this. But what I did do was... Uh, Routledge asked me to update America before the European invasions. Okay. Hello, and welcome to my channel. I am Damien Marie at Hope. In the simplest terms, I am an atheist humanist philosopher and prehistorical writer researcher at DamienMarieAtHope.com. I am specifically an axiological atheist. An axiological atheism can be thought to involve ethical and value theory reasoned and moral argument driven apathyism, agnosticism, atheism, antitheism, anti religionism, secularism, and humanism. Axiological atheists can be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. As an axiological atheism's ethically reasoned and constructive pro-humanity, I am an axiological thinker, value theorist. The science of goodness, worthiness, usefulness, valuableness, Virtue, reliableness, accuracy, validity, morality, integrity, beneficialness, etc., etc. We axiologists have a value consciousness. And in general, we see the architecture of humanistic humanitarianism value in people that we see as dignity beings. Places and things are not. Axiology is a value theory. In its broadest sense, it involves areas of philosophy that are deemed to encompass some evaluative or evaluation aspect. Therefore, it crosses almost all domains in some way or another. Now for a more detailed terms as to what I am. I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science. And I'm against pseudoscience, pseudo history, pseudo morality, things that are found in religion. 